I would like now to introduce to you Alison McCartney, who is a um, politics news application developer at ProPublica, where she's helping to build and redesign Represent, a web application for congressional data. Um, before that, she worked with us here at the Brown Institute. Um, and she also previously has worked for the Center for Investigative Reporting and for the PBS NewsHour in Washington. She has worked on several award-winning news applications at CIR, including The Lost and the Found and The Wall. And she, had, uh, she earned her master's degree in journalism here with us at Stanford. Uh, and she earned a degree in Middle Eastern Studies and Art from Washington University in St. Louis. So join me in welcoming Allison. Um, hi, guys. Um, yeah, so as Anne said, um, I am a news applications developer at ProPublica. And um, we're one of the few organizations that has a dedicated news apps team. So we have about um, 15 people who work full time on creating um, graphics, bots, um, and uh, full-scale applications for news purposes. So I want to start off today talking a little bit about like uh, what are news applications and why do we make them at news organizations. Um, so just like any sort of application, news apps can take the form of games, interactive databases, Twitter bots, stories, and graphics. Um, but what makes them different from other types of apps is that they always have a, a news angle. Um, they're always trying to tell a story. Um, and so uh, that story can be in learning. In this case, uh, this was a story about the New York Times, uh, by the New York Times about the correlation between um, the, p the income of parents and uh, what percentage of like their children attend college. And so a lot of people would think like, oh, there's probably a straight upward trajectory um, as, as uh, parents' income increases, but maybe like the super rich don't necessarily send their kids to college at the same rate. Um, and by having you draw that line, the New York Times is asking you to think very uh, like intensively about like why you're making these decisions. Um, and then, uh, by creating a line at the end that shows you what the actual correlation is, um, it impresses upon you like what, uh, what the point is of that story that they're trying to make. So it's like a simple game um, that, that really tells a story that sets the um, stage for the article that comes after. Um, so it personalizes the news experience for audiences. Um, as well as uh, makes it easier for journalists to, to do their jobs. And I'll be, I'll be talking a little bit about news applications that are used as reporting tools as well as storytelling tools today. Um, as to why news organizations make them, uh, news applications, um, unlike stories, which are often one and done, or at best like uh, done in series over a, a, a short amount of time, um, News applications create a very long trail of traffic to a news organization's website. So one of the applications that um, I'll show you in a second uh, is Dollars for Docs, which is one of the first major news applications that was put out by a news organization, ProPublica. It was created by um, Dan Wynn, who's over at the journalism department here, and Jeff Larson, who was here a couple weeks ago, um, also helped with that. Uh, Dollars for Docs, I think, was created in it was uh, 2010, I believe, um, and it continues to be the number one like clicked through page on ProPublica's website every single week today. Um, so news applications that are relevant to the readers, provide valuable information, and are well maintained continue to to be um, money makers for for news organizations. ProPublica, after it does investigations, takes its data, cleans it, and puts it in the data store, which then allows other people to come in uh, and use the data for verification purposes, as well as create a revenue stream back to ProPublica. Um, so they're just uh, those are just a couple of ways in which news applications actually um, generate different types of revenue streams that help um, news organizations that have the ability to make them and maintain them uh, more profitable. Um, so uh, I, I'm pulling up a few notable news apps just so that um, we can uh, kind of 
I can show you the, the breadth of what they are, and then I'll get into like the type that represent is. So this is one of my fav favorite news applications that was made um, in the last uh, few years, and it's uh, the next to die from the Marshall Project, where they take public data about people who are, are scheduled to be executed, and then um, display it in a really simple, powerful um, format so that you can uh, see the next person who's scheduled to be executed and read their story. Um, and this has been used um, as a reporting tool to kick off um, not only like uh, an overview of um, execution in America, but also uh, it allows them to, to take a look at these people's lives and, and spark reporting based off of um, what their data is telling them. So this is just like a very beautiful way in which news application can be uh, incorporated into storytelling. Um, the Marshall Project also uh, created this one, which I like in, in sort of its gamified uh, content, because um, you know there was a there was a movement about um, having the prison population, um, which sounds like a fantastic goal considering that um, American prisons are overcrowded. Um, but they took a look at the numbers on um, who is actually in prison by the crimes they have committed, and um, asked you, based off of what crime these people have committed, to lower their prison population to get it to the point um, where there's exactly half of the amount of people in prison today as there, there were when you started. And the interesting thing is, is like as you work through the application, you know, like, oh, well, drug possession, let's take that down to zero people, um, or other drug crimes. Burglary, okay, no, no there. Uh, fraud. So you take it down to, from all of the, the nonviolent crimes to see that even if you let go of every single person who was in prison for a nonviolent offense, you'd still only be down to 55, 54%. So um, to actually have the prison population, you have to start letting people out of prison um, based off of more violent offenses, um, which was the point that they were trying to make here, uh, which was that uh, while the movement is, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a great goal to have the, the overcrowded prison population in America, um, you have to really look at the, the numbers that are involved and like what that might entail um, from the public. Um, another uh, fantastic civic news app that we saw um, this past year was from the Washington Post um, which I thought was just the most beautiful thing that they'd ever created, um, which was um, you type in a year, your birth year, and um, let's see, 1970. And it'll show you all of the eclipses that will um, happen on Earth during your lifetime, considering you will live this, this amount of time longer. Um, and which ones you have the best chance of seeing. Um, which I think is really fantastic. So it, it personalizes the data to people's relevant interests. Um, but the thing about these news apps is that um, they're mostly uh, trying to tell one story. So you have like eclipses or the story of prison populations, um, the story of a man who's about to die. Um, but there's also like uh, news applications that are more kitchen sink apps, uh, apps that are uh, designed to um, pull together a lot of disparate information from various sources to try and create like the most amount of uh, insight into um, a particular topic based off of um, uh, uh, conglomerating all of that information into one place. Um, so we see these uh, in Census Reporter, which was created by a, a journalist uh, to take census data that is generally extremely difficult to work with um, and not insightful in the way that the government pre presents it on the website and um, turn it into an application that allows people to actually gain meaning out of that, out of that data. Open Elections, um, which was also started by my boss, Derek Willis, um, is a um, effort to get election data, um, county, state, local, uh, and national election data all into one place. Um, a lot of these news applications uh, deal with civic data that is public, but 
uh, isn't actually useful to the public. Um, so, you know, uh, Derek here has a, he got into a Twitter battle this weekend um, with somebody from an open data uh, coalition in Leeds who was trying to make the point that um, PDFs are, are crap, but uh, they are at least the first tier of open data. Um, Derek shot back with the point that PDF as an open data format is basically useless to anybody who wants to learn anything from this information. So Derek, as part of um, open elections, um, gets data like this back from the precinct level of, of, of his election data. Uh, handwritten, um, very dirty, uh, completely unusable because it's usually, um, uh, he has to get it from uh, individual offices. It's not posted online anywhere. Um, and so this basically is the state of government open data. Um, and open data is uh, in a lot of danger at the moment. Um, lots of data sources that we have taken for granted are um, uh, in trouble, including census data. Um, as well as environmental data. And so um, there's a real tension between like, what the government provides as open data and what is actually useful to the public. Um, useful data to the public requires context, it requires accessibility, requires searchability. And so um, what news applications try and do is bridge that gap between what the government provides as open data and what people can action uh, people can base their actions off of. So um, while this may be open data here in this PDF format, um, people will actually be able to um, uh, go out and do something about it once it's in a CSV form, once it's on a website, once you can search it. Um, so that's what uh, civic news apps really um, try and do. Um, I worked on a civic data uh, project uh, with the Brown Institute, which is all about um, government contracting data, um, which is uh, fortunately at least provided on the internet as a CSV file. Um, but that isn't necessarily even uh, the best um, starting place for, for um, open data projects. Uh, the, the data I worked with um, seems small to a lot of computer scientists, but is really huge for most journalists. Um, you know, it would involve 250 columns. I'd uh, be working with 50 million rows. And so when you're trying to um, talk about the story of like how the government spends its money, uh, just getting a plain CSV format back is not necessarily a great place to start. Uh, well, it's a good place to start, but not a good place to end. And um, so that's where we would step in and, and try and bridge that gap. So what I'm working on right now is um, Represent, which is uh, ProPublica's uh, congressional tracking application. Um, and Congress, uh, Congress's data uh, is not centralized, which was the starting place for Represent. Um, vote information, uh, member statements, their leaves of absence, the bills they create, um, the bills they co-sponsor, um, committee, uh, committee information. Like This is all kind of dispersed among several different APIs. Uh, to get the statements, we scrape each individual member of Congress's website, um, which often change based off of uh, people redesigning their website. Um, and so, an effort like a represent has has tried to they've tried to take uh, they've tried to make this happen several times before, so um, it started as a New York Times project uh, under actually it started as a Washington Post project under Derek's um, supervision um, to track bills and votes uh, when Derek left the Washington Post to go to the New York Times um, the people at the Washington Post didn't want to maintain the project. Um, which is a very common um, problem in the, as Mike knows, probably. Uh, once you leave a news organization as a developer, usually all of your knowledge goes with you. It's very difficult to maintain projects once the person who started that project leaves. Um, so he took it to the New York Times, uh, resurrected it there as a bills and votes counter. Um, and when he left the New York Times to come to ProPublica, they also just decided that they weren't going to maintain the application anymore. 
Um, but fortunately, um, they decided that it was an important enough project that they wanted to um, just give it to ProPublica. So um, they, they gave us all the code that had uh, previously been uh, used for uh, Inside Congress, which is what it was called at, uh, at the New York Times. And um, it got res resurrected once again last year during ProPublica's Election Land Initiative, where they worked with the New York Times, USA Today. Um, uh, there's like 15 sponsors, so I can't name them all. But um, they added um, all sorts of features like member pages um, and uh, uh, just better vote and bill, bill trackers. Um, as part of that effort. And then they called it Represent after an, as an homage to another project that Derek worked on. Um, but after the election last year, um, uh, ProPublica got a lot of money, as did a lot of other uh, nonprofit news organizations. Um, and because we live in the nonprofit world, uh, that money is, due, um, is only viable until the end of this year. So what ProPublica decided to do is hire a bunch of news applications developers with that money to revamp all of their applications um, to make them more usable to the public. And Represent was one of those projects, and I was one of those people. Um, so we've been on a year-long sprint um, to, to revamp Represent into uh, Represent 2.0, um, which is going to be uh, much more usable to people. And so we've been going page by page and, and um, trying to uh, not just ask the question of like, what is Congress up to, but what do Congress people spend their time on? Um, which is a much more complicated question to, to answer. Um, and so earlier this year, we sat down um, with Tron Ha from the D School. Uh, she also used to, do you know Tron? Um, yeah, she also used to work at the Washington Post, I believe. And um, she took us through um, a series of uh, d-school uh, processes, uh, and we talked to a bunch of potential users about uh, what we wanted Represent to be. And so uh, we decided to refocus on uh, uh, journalists from local markets and um, higher level users, people who already knew something about Congress, but wanted to um, really track either individual Congress people or, or um, delegations of people. And so um, uh, the redesign process that we've been implementing is not just a visual redesign, but a, but a real, real rethinking of, of what is important to people to know uh, about their Congress people. So um, when we first got Represent, uh, this is largely what it looked like. Um, it, uh, when they resurrected it last year, they, they put very little um, time into trying to revamp the, um, the, the face of it. So uh, we inherited a lot of nine-year-old code from the New York Times, um, basically. And so um, uh, what we're trying to do now is um, think about like what, um, what might people want to know in a breaking news event um, about their Congress people? So when Charlottesville happened, um, you might want to know what your representatives are saying about Charlottesville. Um, because, you know, in the aftermath, we had a lot of um, uh, people saying incredible things. Um, and a lot of Congress people get by without um, without having to say anything, because they get lost in, in the milieu. So we've been using um, topic modeling word to vec um, word to vec is a, um, uh, basically a, some complicated math that um, figures out uh, what, relationships word, uh, what relationships different words have to one another. So we threw all of Congress's statements into a, um, a word to vec um, program, and uh, it learned a lot of things about Congress. So it learned things like the death tax and the estate tax are the same thing. Um, it learned that um, something that uh, Ralph Abraham talks about more than any other uh, person in Congress, 
uh, is uh, sweet potatoes down here. Um, because apparently his state has a new type of sweet potato. Um, it learned that one congressman talks about salads a lot because he introduced a bill about healthy eating in schools. Um, and uh, it learned that uh, certain members of Congress sound like one another in their statements. So, um, so this congressperson sounds like um, all of these other members of Congress, both uh, House members and Senate members. Uh, and so uh, what's interesting about, about this part of the process is similar members, um, it's just using like what words they have in their statements to find which members of Congress talk most like other members of Congress. And it's not always um, members of the same party. Uh, so what you really learn from this is uh, what people care about uh, across party lines. Um, so natural coalition members, people who uh, vote together, um, but also try and propose legislation together. You can uh, sometimes pr predict using um, the words that they use in their statements. Um, and distinctive topics, uh, while it's fun to find things like sweet potato um, and you know, disability assistance, um, it's really getting to this point where um, okay, Representative Abraham talks more about disability assistance than most other members of Congress. We're like very close to that point where we can say that, that Representative Abraham cares more about disability assistance than other members of Congress, which is really the point that we want to get to next, is really determining like, what do members of Congress care about? What do they spend their time on? And, and do those interests align with you as the voting public? Um, so uh, when we got, first got these member pages, um, they looked a lot like this. Um, they focused primarily on votes um, with a little bit of information about um, uh, their voting, votes against party, votes they missed, uh, things they often uh, proposed legislation on. And so we've really been trying to refine that um, over time to where um, not only do we have votes against party, but like the rank of that person out of all members of Congress. Do, the, do, they, oft, do they vote against their party more often than a typical member of Congress? Do they miss more or less votes than a typical member of Congress? Which are all important factors in determining like what kind of a job your le legislator is doing for you. Um, so another part of the redesign is, um, is just uh, information availability and information design. Um, so we went, we did away with things like uh, just uh, counting a person's votes and instead um, created like an activity feed. So you can see all of the things that that congressperson has done uh, recently. So here on the live site, um, oh, speaking of, this is a, like the prototype next step of the site. Um, and then um, this is what the site looks like at the current moment. Um, so you can take things like um, if they vote on something and then they uh, make a statement on it right afterwards. You'll be able to see those things in tandem. Um, sometimes they explain their votes. Let me see if this guy has any personal, he you know, doesn't have any personal explanations. But um, Sometimes if they miss a vote, they'll provide an explanation to Congress, which is put in a different place than their votes and a different place from their statements. Um, and so now we can see all of those things together in one place. Uh, I know Janet Napo or, uh, Grace Napolitano um, has had a lot of personal explanations recently because her husband has been in the hospital, um, so she's missed a lot of votes. Um, a funny thing is, is, as soon as we started putting this all up in the same place, uh, my boss Derek started getting emails from members of Congress in advance of them missing votes. Um, they'd be like, hey, just wanted to, you to know I'm going to be missing a vote next Thursday. Um, I promise it's because my husband's in the hospital um, and not because I just wanted to miss the vote. Can you put this up on your website? And uh, of course Derek's like, well, you know, just submit your ex explanation to Congress and, and it'll, it'll show up there. Um, but there's really no um, better way to know that we're starting to make an impact on how um, members of Congress see their actions um, in Congress more than actually like 
getting notes from them about what they're doing. Um, Derek always used to say that like, um, uh, if you got an email from a member of Congress, it was never a good thing. Um, they were always yelling at you about something you wrote. But now uh, it's a very different experience to like get um, notes from Congress about, sorry about this, um, this is what I'm going to be doing next. Um, so the activity feeds have really like changed the way in which um, we, we try and uh, show how Congress people spend their time. Um, oh, yeah. And we've basically um, uh, revamped everything to make it a lot easier to see um, how uh, people vote against their party, um, how they, uh, you know, let's see. So, if, for example, here on Anna Eshoo, like, it looks as though she, uh, if a bill fails, she most likely has voted against her party to help that bill fail. And that's, um, that's something we didn't know before. So we also used to have bill category pages that looked like this that were pretty difficult to use. Um, so uh, basically, they were just cartograms. Uh, this is from uh, the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine, so not all of the cartograms are loading. But um, uh, we took that and turned that into this page, which I think is a lot easier to read, uh, where we would uh, highlight any bills that have recently been signed into law, um, what their vote split was, sponsor, and whether they had bipartisan co-sponsorship or co-sponsorship of one party. Um, we are highlighting major bills, or sorry, major votes on major pieces of legislation, like here's the vote on the American Health Care Act uh, in the House. Um, and then doing an activity feed of all of the um, the bills that, that are in that category. So making it a lot easier for uh, people to uh, find exactly what their members of Congress are up to. So if, um, oh, there we go. Um, so if you want to know like what uh, California Congress people are doing on the subject of health, um, all you have to do is uh, filter and um, see all of the pieces of legislation that California Congress people are uh, submitting on that subject. Um, which gets us to one thing we, we learned from the, um, uh, where'd it go? One thing we learned from our D-School workshop, which is that um, local reporters use our tool a lot to um, try and cover their local congressional delegations. Um, because it's really hard to cover um, a bunch of Congress people at once using all of the disparate sources of data that um, are available to them. Um, so out of that, we went and created congressional delegation pages that were really geared towards helping local reporters do their job quicker. So we took um, uh, the activity feed format that we'd created for member pages and then applied them to entire member or entire congressional delegations. So if you're interested in the California congressional delegation, uh, here's every statement, every vote, every bill, every personal explanation um, that they've provided um, over the last three months, um, which is really uh, geared towards um, that like expert level of user instead of just a, a, a typical person who uh, might come to the site randomly and not know what their congressional delegation means. Um, and then, of course, we also provide a full list of who's in that congressional delegation um, and whether there are any open seats, where those open seats are. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's one thing we've added as a result of like, the D-School work workshopping that we've done. Um, another thing we added was the ability to compare um, Congress people. Um, so uh, uh, compare their vote records. So basically we took uh, every two members of Congress and um, compared all of their votes. And um, every, uh, every week, I believe, we, no, every day, we create a, a new match uh, between every two members of the same house or the, the same chamber to um, determine like, who agrees and who disagrees the most, um, and what are the things they, they disagree and agree on. 
And so we created um, these, these uh, voting records pages that allows you to compare um, any two members of Congress. And so since these two members of Congress are from the same party, um, we return to you all of the votes that these two members disagreed on. Um, if they're from different parties, we return a list of all of the votes that they um, have agreed on. Um, and so it, uh, it's, it's meant to really highlight the, the differences between um, how members of Congress um, uh, vote within their delegations and within their parties. Um, and that, that's been a really successful um, new aspect of the application. Um, so in addition to all of this stuff that we've been adding to the interface, um, one of the really sad things that's happened in the news applications world over the last couple of years is um, uh, the shutting down of uh, certain news applications teams um, throughout the industry. Uh, the uh, New York Times Lab, um, the uh, or yeah, the um, New York Public Library R and D team, the uh, and then probably most consequentially the um, the Sunlight Labs team. Um, do you guys know Sunlight Labs at all? Have you ever used their stuff before? Yeah. Um, so Sunlight Labs is sort of um, the place to go for a lot of government and civic data. Um, and they shut down last year um, at a time when we probably could have used them. Um, and so all of the projects that Sunlight Labs worked on, including uh, Pollet Whoops, which was the application that um, they track the Twitter accounts of every um, member of Congress, and if they delete a tweet, it catches the deleted tweets. So a few weeks ago, uh, if uh, you saw the news item about Ted Cruz accidentally tweeting out um, a pornography video that he should not have tweeted out and then deleting it. Um, Paula Oops, resurrected by um, ProPublica, was the one that caught that. So um, what happened with Sunlight Labs is uh, they had um, lots of applications that were, uh, that, that were re related to Congress, including Paula Oops, uh, Capital Words, the Congress API, uh, or the Sunlight API that's now the Congress API. And so basically we took all of that uh, work that um, Sunlight had did and uh, uh, resurrected it uh, at ProPublica. So um, the remnants of the Sunlight API are now part of our Congress API that we're now providing all of the data that we use on the site in one place. So anybody who wants to create applications um, about uh, Congress or learn more about their congressional representatives in a more data-based API way, um, you can sign up for an API key and use all of our data, which is really exciting. Um, and then uh, we also took Pollet Whoops and resurrected it. Um, so uh, we're going to be s starting to dump all of this information into Represent as well. So if, for example, somebody um, deletes a tweet that is co uh, of consequence, we'll be including that in their activity feeds also, because that, that does matter in a lot of these cases. Um, although most of the time, most congressional representatives are, are deleting things based off of um, uh, you know, typos, or they didn't include the link, or they included the wrong link. But every once in a while, you, you know, you, you get things that, that are, are pretty great and create stories. Um, and so we're starting to include that as well into what we do. Um, and then uh, another project we're working on, uh, in addition to all of this, is um, last year we released an If Then Then That. Do you guys know what? OK, you know what it is. So for those who don't know, um, If Then Then That uh, is a um, than this. If it is, if then, then this, or if then, then that. If this, then that. If this, then that. Sorry, there's too many T's in that. If this, then that. Um, um, uh, we, we released a bunch of formulas that you can use uh, whenever a bill is signed into law, um, or if you only want to know about bills that involve health care, um, or um, you know, tax reform, uh, you can get a 
uh, an email or a message whenever what a bill like that is introduced into Congress. Um, so uh, all of these things broke. <laughs> Um, so we're resurrecting all of this right now. So you'll be able to uh, create notifications for things you care about in Congress um, as a part of what we're uh, working on right now. Um, so that's, that's a lot of stuff um, and a lot of things that we're, we've got in the works that we'll be releasing by the end of this year because, as I said, our money runs up at the end of this year. So it's been a, um, a monumental effort on the part of me, Derek Willis, uh, Jeremy Merrill, um, and uh, Scott Klein and CC Way at, at ProPublica to really revamp the entire application um, before, before our money runs out at the end of the year on this. Um, so, you know, we're really happy to um, talk about um, anything you'd like to, to know about uh, in, uh, you know, on the application, any features you'd like us to add. Um, uh, you know, we're open to hearing it as people who deal both with data and with um, covering uh, uh, public officials. So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, so absolutely, like creating ways to contact um, their representatives is, is really like a shorthand, a uh, shortcut for um, reporters to uh, report on these people. Um, but it also ends up being a nice shortcut for um, citizens to contact their representatives if they see anything um, on our timeline uh, that they would like to reach out to their representatives about. Um, the one thing we don't do super well at ProPublica right now, anyway, um, that we're implementing as part of the second um, version two of the application is we don't do analytics all that well. Um, so we don't have um, a track of exactly how many people click through on those contact forms to talk to their representatives. But that's something that we want to be able to do um, as, as part of the next um, effort on represent. Um. Um, thank you for being here today. And I also enjoyed visiting represent. My question is about uh, looking toward the future. What we, uh, are you thinking about the following scenario? I would have loved to have gone in and typed in gun control and then how people voted and how much money they got from the NRA. Do you foresee tying those together in the future as you go forward? Yeah, so um, it's, it's a tough problem, actually, to, to wrangle everything related to a specific topic. Um, but that's one thing that we're trying to work on with our topic, topic modeling. So one thing that we've been trying to think about um, that our, our social team and other teams have been thinking about is um, the, the question they wanted to know is, um, uh, after Hurricane Harvey happened, um, Ted Cruz came out with some statements about um, hurricane relief, um, but he'd very publicly come out against a hurricane relief when it was Sandy in New York. So is there a way to see, um, based off of um, you know, using machine learning and sentiment analysis to see when members of Congress switch their positions over time. Um, and I think that's a related question um, to looking up uh, gun control and how they voted. Um, because it, it's basically about grouping activities within Congress within um, specific subject areas. And so right now we group statements by that. So if um, you know, we have a, a grouping for the, in, the Russia investigation or, or Charlottesville about all of the congressional statements that have been based off of that, um, we're trying to throw in bills 
um, and floor speeches, um, and uh, any sort of, uh, hopefully in the future, tweets um, about these topics into one and then pull quotes out of them so that you can see like the actual words that they've said about these subjects. Um, so the shorter answer is um, when it comes to grouping things together based off of uh, subject matter, votes, bills, statements, yes, we're, we're working on that right now. Um, and uh, when it comes to campaign finance or linking out to campaign finance, it's been discussed. Um, campaign finance, I feel like whenever you do an application that's civically related, um, somebody is always like, can it link to a campaign finance? Um, can, it, can it link to, you know, um, uh, whatever uh, money that person has received from outside organizations? Um, it's, it's not a thing that we've directly decided to link out to right now. You know, Open Secrets does a great job of uh, tracking campaign finance. Um, and so potentially, like right now, what the workflow would be like is you look up your person on represent, you um, find out the things that they voted on that are related to that category, and then you'd have to go to Open Secrets or a supplementary website to, to find that campaign finance information. Um, right now, I don't think we're set to change that right now, um, but we are hoping to make it easier on our side to uh, to know what your congressperson has done in the topic of gun control. Yeah. I, so there's a lot of just, I, I just want to say there's a lot of awesome stuff and I have all these notes of like cool things that I can think of here. Um, so I'll try to pick like one um, and sort of comment on the first point that you made. Um, I think one really cool thing could be uh, looking at something like if people on Twitter are uh, at mentioning like, Paul Ryan or something like that, mm -hmm. and mentioning a certain topic a lot. Uh, I could imagine his profile page on, on Represent would indicate like what has his, what has been his response to this topic that's been kind of trending on Twitter. Yeah. It sounds like their absence from votes has become more of an important issue to them. Uh, and so that sounds like something that... Yeah. Cool. Um, the question that I had though was, uh, it sounds, or I think like one of the things that I'm maybe like concerned about is that if uh, somebody's willingness to break away from party line um, becomes a matter of, mm -hmm. let's say, more salient record, then they might be tempted or, pers or sort of like motivated or pushed towards just towing the line all the mm -hmm. time. Is that a concern that you all have by highlighting all that information and making it clear, for instance, that a representative has broken party lines and voted with the other side? Uh, yeah. Or is, is this sort of to or do you think of it more as like you're highlighting bipartisanship because people are working together? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I think that's a difficult question to answer. Um, I, I know that Derek, my boss, has thought about this. Um, when I first was talking to him about, um, about all of this, he was concerned about um, turning politics into a team sport, um, which I think uh, a lot of outlets, while they cover politics um, tend to make it out to be a team sport, um, which is dangerous. Um, and um, that, you know, I, I don't think that uh, by highlighting it on our site, we're necessarily changing the behaviors of anybody in Congress. Um, but another thing to consider is like, as the political winds change, um, how people view that number, um, it could be favorable or unfavorable, um, but I, 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 I don't necessarily think that um, there. You know, I don't think we're that influential yet. I guess my like my my concern is that it seems like, um, for instance, their absence on votes has become more important to them. Yeah. Now they do care about something. Yeah. About. So clearly, you are more influential than. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is also um, like an issue with news apps more generally speaking is, you know, by creating, uh, by creating numbers and statistics around phenomena, like are you altering phenomena? Um, and I think that just generally our, our, um, our position on that is that um, we're, we're there to measure. Um, if people decide to act on, on that information, that's up to them. Um, but uh, we shouldn't not measure that just because 
um, somebody might decide to change their vote based off of that number. Um, and uh, about the first thing, we do have a relationship with Google News. Um, so this was a, another um, app that was created as part of Election Land last year, which was the Election Data Bot, um, which was um, basically a, f a fire hose of, of campaign spending and filing. And um, it, it, it also included trending on Google uh, members of Congress. So um, right now we are working with Google on ways that we can incorporate uh, trending information into uh, represent. So if a member of Congress is, tr so the other thing about trending is like members of Congress trend in very different ways than you know, Kim Kardashian trends, right? Like on any given day, there will be a thousand times you know, more searches for Kim Kardashian than even like the most important member of Congress. So, you know, spikes in trending are a little bit different to work with when you're working with, you know, uh, Bill Nelson, for example, um, over, you know, something much more popular than that. So we're trying to figure out ways to incorporate Google Trends data into the application without like spuriously like uh, highlighting trending information just because like two people Googled it in Minnesota or something like that. So, yeah. So it seems like funding is, could be an issue going down, uh, down the road. And so I'm just wondering like how you guys are thinking about that because I know you're obviously nonprofit and you get a lot of your money from donations, but yeah. like, this seems like you could have a lot of B2B implications if you expanded. I'm, I'm sure even like a lot of would like this to have this like mm, yeah. central database just to have what they need. They gladly pay for it. So I'm wondering like if that's something that you're thinking about like down the road. So if your boss leaves, yeah, leave. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it is. Uh, during our uh, initial D school workshopping um, at the beginning of the year, um, we brought in our uh, business development person at ProPublica who works with um, our applications team to try and find ways to um, uh, monetize or make sustainable all of our projects. Um, and so um, the answer to that is yes, we're thinking about it. <laughs> um, but, but, um, we're not yet including our data from this application in our data store, which is typically how we make the app sustainable financially. Um, and uh, right now, uh, the, there, like, the funding situation means that development on the application uh, will probably start to slow down after the beginning of the year. Um, so we're currently looking into ways that we can uh, keep it sustainable monetarily without charging for the API. Um, so that's, that's a current discussion we're having and I don't think we've yet arrived on an answer to that. Yeah. Um, so, right now, um, we're also working on a set of tools within the new, because we're, we're not just trying to be an outwardly facing app, we're trying to uh, work within our own news organization to create tools for our reporters to do better reporting. So, um, that involves like outreach within our own newsroom to like whenever we report on um, such and such a vote. Um, here's a way that you can refer to um, our votes and our, the, the bills, members of Congress, et cetera. Um, also our partnership with Google News that we're working on is, um, you know, I, I, I don't know how much I can talk about with that, but basically we're working on ways to surface represents information um, about um, members of Congress um, in a way that makes sense to people who are trying to search for their members of Congress on Google. Um, and that, I'm not sure when that's going to happen, but um, we're working on that right now with Google News. Um, we also have, are working on partnerships with um, larger news organizations um, who would like to uh, use Represent as an internal tool as well. 
Um, so we're working with them to create like a set of standards for them to link to our site from within their own no uh, news articles. Yeah. Thank you, guys, uh, as for sharing this. Um, so you mentioned that you apply D school tools to develop, represent, such as uh, from defining uh, the project to ideate and to prototype. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk a little more on your uh, working approach to represent? Did you do a lot of uh, interviews and, and what, what did you do to design the focus? Yeah. Represent? Yeah, so the interesting way that we used uh, the D school process was that. Um, it wasn't used at the beginning of the project, right? The project had already existed for, in various forms for um, eight years until it was resurrected last year. And then the D-School workshopping was done in March or April. Um, and so uh, it was done as like a midpoint, a, a project um, refocus in a way. So we already kind of knew things that were working, but we hadn't really thought about um, intensely, like now that the election is over, uh, why should this continue to exist and who do we want to reach? Um, and so uh, working with Tron, um, she uh, and several people on our team conducted a series of interviews with uh, target groups that we were hoping to reach um, and included a, um, a, a student who was in the debate club. Uh, it included a, a Washington reporter who was um, from a local market. Uh, it included um, a, what are they called? Farmers, like a farmers union um, in, in the Midwest who, who distribute information on voting to people in the community. Um, and so we talked, to, um, uh, we talked to people who didn't care about politics. Um, who like tuned in once every four years for the presidential election and then forgot about it afterwards. Um, and so through those um, interviews, they then took people through the application to try and find where the sticking points were um, and what features that they would want to see on the app that, that weren't currently there. And so that's how we started designing like the new pages. Um, it's how I'm starting to rethink the navigation system within the app because right now if you go there, there's no navigation bar. So like how do you find what is available on the application? Um, and those are all things that emerged from talking to a lot of these target groups individually. And then we, we re, um, we, it was a several months long process. I think it was three or four months that we worked with Tron where we, um, you know, uh, talked with users and then went back and designed some more pages and then uh, put those out to social media to see how they were received and then went back and talked to more people and created more pages. And so um, it, was, it was a pretty involved process. Yeah. So I noticed that you had partnerships with GovTrack and with C-SPAN. And could you talk about the strategy behind these partnerships and if you, are there any other partners you're planning or would like to bring on board? Yeah, so the thing about um, civic data and news applications in general is um, because resources are scarce, um, you don't want to keep reinventing the wheel. You don't want to do what GovTrack's already done. You don't want to do what Open Secrets has already done because um, they've you know, they've had the resources, they've created the, the, um, the seminal application for that. Um, and so uh, C-SPAN and GovTrack had already done a lot of work that um, we are recreating in part, but not in full. Um, and so we wanted to connect uh, readers to um, other applications that um, might supplement their understanding of the subject matter. Um, so it's not a, you know, so you don't want to be in competition with these places. You want to provide your reader with the, the most amount of materials possible. Um, we don't have any other partnerships like that planned, um, but we are trying to work with um, Google News, for example, to uh, incorporate, uh, like right now we use Google News, um, let me see. Uh, yeah, so right now we use Google News to pull in news articles about members of Congress. Um, so uh, this is a thing that we didn't have before. 
Um, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, I think it, it's a really nice supplement to the, the work that we're already doing. So uh, w we're really trying to work with them to, to pull in more um, information that our users might find interesting, but no new partnerships, as far as I understand. Yeah. Also, I may have missed this. So, is there a place here where I, as a constituent, can speak to my congressman on this? Um, so, it's we have full contact information on each page here. Um, so, website, phone number all of their social media and where you can find them on other websites. Um, but not directly through through No, not through us. No. Yeah. Um, and I have another question about news apps in general. Do you see a sort of maturation of this process ha happening where you don't have this sort of posse of news app developers jumping from shop to shop and giving up their IP? I mean, it's surprising to me when you think you know, a place like Stanford, you develop something here, Stanford owns the IP. Same thing with what we think of the New York Times or yeah. uh, the Washington Post. But if that's being sort of left in the dust, do you see that starting to change? Yeah, um, in, in a lot of ways it is. I would say I'm like second generation news apps developer. Um, the first generation was Dan Nguyen, jo Jeff Larson, Jeremy Bowers, who's now at the New York Times, Derek Willis, who's my boss. Um, and when they started in the field, it was very new. Um, when Dan started at ProPublica, it was him, his editor, and a web producer, and that was the whole team. Um, now there's you know, a dozen people who work for that team um, and, and processes that have been set up. Um, the other thing is that when the field was just starting, um, and even today, actually, like most news apps developers don't start off in the computer science world. Um, they start off as reporters, um, like just daily beat reporters for um, local newspapers. And, and what happens is um, they uh, like have to do some web producing. So they like write some HTML and CSS and like, oh, let me do a data visualization. And so you just so slowly slide into it. And there's incentives as a reporter to learn a lot about um, programming in the newsroom because uh, you know reporter salaries aren't very high. Um, so if you learn some computer skills, you are suddenly eligible for a whole new set of jobs that you were not eligible for before. Um, uh, you know, and so it, if you're if you're starting off in the computer science world, um, there there are some people like Gabriel Dance who um, was a Marshall Project. Um, and uh, some people at the New York Times who come from the computer science world into news, but like the, you know, the news world cannot pay you as much as Facebook and Google will pay you to do whatever you do. And so there's, there's less of a flow of computer scientists into journalism and more um, a process of journalists becoming computer literate. And so um, when that was happening, uh, people were uh, uh, not creating replicable code in their newsrooms. They weren't documenting it. They, they didn't know any of the um, procedures to hand off code to the next group of developers. And so um, uh, nowadays, um, the field's more mature. Reporters are much better developers now. There's a few more people coming in from the computer science world. Um, and so the procedures around like um, maintaining code have gotten a lot, a lot more rigid. Um, over the past few years, in my experience at least. And, and to the computer science students who are in this room, yeah. um, do you want to make a pitch? Yes, please, come work with us. <laughs> like, y you will be a god in the newsroom. If you know how to write one line of CSS, you will be bowed down to by a bunch of reporters, like I promise you. Um, you know, you, yeah, I, I think that um, the, the computer science people who do come into journalism, um, come in because they uh, see it as a way to like really help out organizations that need help um, because uh, you know it, it could be your tour of, of duty 
so to say, in like a computer science uh, world where like you can come in and you can help out like maintaining systems, um, uh, doing data visualization, doing work that like really matters to the civic sphere. Um, because, uh, you know, for a long time, there just weren't enough really good programmers in, in, the, um, in the news world for that. We're getting there. We're slowly getting there, but yeah. How do you deal with the transparency that they give you into their algorithms? Yeah. Um, so I don't maintain that relationship. Um, that's my boss. Um, so I, I can't fully speak to that. Um, they definitely don't let us like directly into their algorithms or anything like that. Um, that you know that's beyond our scope, um, but uh, I'm not exactly sure um, how much transparency beyond that they have. I, you know, I've, I've uh, done things with Facebook in the past, and that's um, not transparent at all um, for news organizations. Um, you know, like <laughs> Washington Post famously had a social reader um, that was getting a million views a day, and Facebook changed its algorithm without telling any news organizations, and the next day they had like next to zero views on that site. Um, so in general, um, I think Google has done a better job of being transparent and working with news organizations than, than you know, Facebook has. Um, but that's because Google does a lot of outreach to news organizations. They hold you know, news summits. They, they really try and... Um, uh, make their presence known to the news community in a way that Facebook doesn't. Like every co every data journalism conference I go to, there's Google Maps people there to teach you about their APIs, and uh, you know Google News people there to to show you how to use trending data. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely more transparent on the Google side than say the Facebook side. One last question. Um, as you so as you like begin to machine learning to do things like cluster topics or surface kind of like more vectors. How do you handle transparency about how those algorithms? We're publishing all the data uh, we're in our algorithms. So um, uh, we haven't published it yet, um, but we're, uh, we are maintaining all of our code in a GitHub repository that we'll, we will be making public by the end of the year with all of our um, code in it um, on how we uh, how we reach those conclusions and since all of our data is available on our API you could potentially go and do it yourself um, so we're trying to make that as transparent as possible okay thank you very much <laughs>